Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Balance in Life, Moving Forward. Uh, we know that many of us have gotten confused in the sea of uh, conversations around recommendations, social distancing, reopening policies, phase one, phase two, almost phase three, mask, what types of mask, how do we wear them? We've been wearing them a while. Shouldn't we be cleaning them or replacing them? And then how do we take all of this information and, and figure out, you know, for our families, what are the events, what are the activities that we want to engage in? Um, what are we comfortable engaging in? What are the things that were on our schedule before that maybe with this reset, we may want to reconsider? Um, all of those things are swirling around in many of our minds. And so we'll cover some highlights on a couple of those pieces today. So I am happy to welcome you to this session. I'm Crystal Tyler Mackey on behalf of Virginia Cooperative Extension Human Development Program Team and our partners at NC State. Today our speakers are, uh, first up will be Katherine Carter and Sam Fisher with Virginia Cooperative Extension, followed by Elizabeth Pittman also with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and then closing us out will be Dr. Kim Allen with NC State. So at this point, I would like to turn the session over to Catherine and Sam. Well, good, good morning, morning everybody. Go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. We're going to um, let Crystal share our screen and we're going to talk to you a little bit about some exciting things that are happening with Virginia 4-H here in the last couple days. Um, we have been able to get approved to begin doing some in-person programming. So we're going to talk to you just a little bit about that, but keep it pretty general in terms of what that's going to look like and how that can apply to you as you and as you personally or you and your families think about getting back into activities as we as we phase in um, to to reopening programming. Some of the things that we considered as we looked at this, um, probably three categories. One was group size. So for us, that's going to be 22 for indoor groups and 50 for outdoor groups. And that's going to vary depending on what it is that you participate in, who the organization is. But as you think about whether or not you want to begin participating in outside activities or getting your family involved, I think that is something that you should consider. Um, and feel free to make sure you ask um, whoever is in charge of that particular activity or organization what the size of the group is, how many people that they will allow. And that directly leads into the next point, which is social distancing, because as we get larger groups and depending on um, what the setting is for the activity or event, whether it's outside or whether it's an indoor venue or a meeting room, um, that will directly impact our ability to practice social distancing. And social distancing is still extremely important. Um, so that's something that you want to take into consideration for most of the guidelines right now. And Sam's going to touch on these um, more in depth than I will. But for most of them, it's, it's a recommended six foot distance. So think about what that looks like. And then the cleaning and sanitation is also very important. And that's something that we've touched on um, very heavily in our 4-H in-person programming um, guidelines is asking, you know, what, what do you have in place for cleaning and sanitation of the venue, um, as well as making sure that folks wash their hands or use hand sanitizer um, or any of those things that are highly recommended. So as you, as you think about getting back involved, these are three areas that I would, um, that I would suggest that you think about and that you look at regarding whatever group is or the activity is going to be um, and feel free because it certainly is our right to ask those questions and see where they are in terms of that um, and whether or not the, you then feel safe to get yourself or your family involved. Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the guidelines and resources that we use to get to where we are? Sure, sure. There, there is so much information out there. It's just information overflow. It's like, where, where do we start? Um, most everybody starts with the CDC. Um, we used a lot of the CDC information, but it came down to pretty much what our state was doing. We looked at the Department of Health. The American Camp Association has uh, great resources out there, but most of our guidelines came down to what is our state doing? What are, what are the governor's guidelines for our phases? and specific to uh, what our needs are. Uh, one of the challenges is where do we fit as 4-H? Um, and we uh, 
we found that uh, with the Department of Social Services, their child care guidelines, we, we relied heavily upon those. The school reopening guidelines for K through 12, and then the social gathering uh, guidelines that were uh, put in place by the governor. And that, again, all the things that Catherine just talked about, the group size, the social distancing, the cleaning and sanitation protocols, all came from those guidelines from our state. And every state is different, let me say. So if you're traveling across states, you, you may wanna check and see what the different states' guidelines are. I know we may have some folks from North Carolina on here. Uh, I would encourage you to look at your, uh, your governor's guidelines, your state-specific guidelines. Check with your Department of Health. And of course, your local uh, departments as well, because even in Virginia, some localities are a little different than others. Um, and we go with the, mo the most restrictive. Um, Northern Virginia was a little slower going into um, our phases. So their, their restrictions were a little different than Southwest Virginia. Um, so again, paying attention to what your locality uh, is doing is really important. But those are, those are the guidelines. Um, that's where we derived our guidelines from is using those sources, but the main source was the governor's uh, guidelines. Thanks, Sam. Um, here in, in Virginia, we are currently in phase two, but we are supposed to transition to phase three next week. So for us, that means that we'll take a look at our guidelines again and make any changes that we need to, to make to make us compatible with phase three. Having reviewed those, the biggest change that we see is simply in terms of gathering numbers. Um, and so, you know, that, that group size of, of 50 for outdoor events um, tends to increase to 250 in phase three for most events, activities, and businesses. So again, as we, as we transition to a new phase and those group sizes increase, um, then again, you need to, to go back and think about what social distancing will look like and what the ability to to keep things clean and sanitized if you're in a venue where there's gonna be high touch or high traffic areas. So those are things that we'll be looking at. Um, again, I know that that is different for each state. One thing that I would encourage you to do, we have access to our governor's guidelines and I'm assuming that that's probably the case across the country. Um, find those and pull those up and you can look at them um, specific to Virginia Everything is in there, everything from restaurants and food and beverage services to we even have specific guidelines for horse and other livestock shows. So it gives you an opportunity um, to be able to look through those and to see exactly what the governor has, suggest has suggested in your particular state um, and what businesses or organizations should be doing in terms of complying with the different guidelines. And that information can be very useful and helpful to each of us as we make decisions about where we go and what activities that we want to participate in. Sam, do you have anything else? I think you, I think you got it. All right, Crystal. Thank you so much. So if you have questions, you're um, welcome to post those in the chat box. We're gonna transition to Elizabeth, who's gonna talk to us about all things mask. I call it Masking 101. Elizabeth. Thanks, Crystal. Um, good morning, everybody. I wanted to preface everything I'm gonna to say today by saying that um, everything I'm talking about comes from straight from the CDC guidelines. Um, both things that I've looked up and that um, I have experience with. I've been a volunteer EMT for five years now. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that I'm having to do basically every day now. Um, so we're gonna get straight into it. Most everyone has seen or has a cloth mask that has the two tie kind of behind the ear loop. So we're gonna start with that. And this can apply to any mask that has ear loops, not just a cloth mask. So one thing you want to make sure of with your masks is a proper fit. Um, a lot of people are aware that they come in all different sizes, especially well, cloth masks they do. But um, we'll also be talking about this kind of style with the two bands for behind the head. And for that one, you really have to make sure you're getting the right size. So the way I like to do it is kind of just grab, see the nose piece here, the little Virginia Tech mask, nose piece, Go over and back, done. You don't even have to touch the outside of the mask. 
You want to make sure it fits at the bottom of your chin. And if it has a nose piece, make sure that it's up and that it's crimped tight to your cheek. You don't want a lot of loose and stuff getting in that and you don't want it slipping down. All right? Take it off is the same motion. Just grab by the loops. And then you're not touching the cloth if anything has gotten on or if it's gotten contaminated while you've been wearing it. But again, make sure you have that tight seal on your cheek and you have a tight seal along your chin. You don't want it hanging underneath your chin and there are a pocket of air that can come in and around. Next kind of mask. This one is where it comes more into play with putting it on properly. So you see that there's two straps, right? They go behind your head. This one I like to do by flipping them into the front. Just flip them into the front and kind of make what looks like a crisscross with the bottom strap coming up over the top strap. So then when you go to put it on, make sure you have a firm seal around your nose, the sides, and then it comes to the bottom of your chin. Again, you don't want it overhanging and you want to make sure it has a good fit all around. Take your bottom strap, bring it over. The bottom strap actually goes underneath your ears, around the back of your head. Top strap, grab. This is the one that rests on the top of your ears and goes around the back of your head. Okay, again, always fit test yourself and make sure that it fits right around your nose and here, and also that you're comfortable and that the bands aren't too tight. Now to take it off, grab the bottom. We don't wanna to be touching the outside of the mask after we've been wearing it out and about, especially if we're wearing it for multiple hours and we don't know what's gotten on it or what we've been exposed to. So grab the bottom and pull it over first. Then top first and you're done. And it's off. You didn't have to touch the mask while doing it. And then if it's disposable, you can discard it if you've been wearing it for eight to 12 hours is usually the suggested time frame. Or you can store it in a paper bag um, for disposables. So disposable masks, I suggest storing in a paper bag just because it allows it to breathe. Um, it doesn't really hold in everything as much. Um, for cloth masks, I suggest washing them every one to two days if you haven't been doing it already. You can wash it with your regular laundry. You just throw it in with the warmest appropriate water, what you're washing, and regular laundry detergent. You can also wash it with bleach by hand washing it. Um, personally, I just put it in through, through my regular laundry load every couple of days, um, but it's a third a cup of bleach or five tablespoons per one gallon of warm water if you're gonna be hand washing it. Either way, you can dry it in your regular dryer or I lay mine flat in the sunlight so that way they air dry. And a lot of that has to do with the different types of mask materials that there are out there now. Um, there's a lot of synthetics and cottons and you never really know what it is. Um, and I, it keeps the integrity and the, sh the shape of the mask as well. Um, a couple questions I've been asked that I just want to say, don't microwave them because you don't know what kind of mask type it is. You don't know if it's a polyester or if there's, if it's not hundred percent cotton, even if it is, I would not suggest doing that. Um, I've had people ask me if they can Lysol their masks. Um, I say yes, but with a lot of caution. Um, I would definitely leave it to air out for eight to 12 hours after you have Lysol it. So you're not inhaling all of that into your body. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And if we have time at the end, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So now we're going to transition over to Kim Allen. Thank you. That, that was so informative. And I do see that there are a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to be quick because I want to see the answer to some of these questions too. Um, 
So hello everybody, my name is Kim and I'm going to be talking just a little bit about the boundaries that we're making. So in Virginia, the young people can come to face-to-face -face programming. That's not true in North Carolina, but there are other activities that, that young people are going to be able to do. So as we are moving out of that stay at home and stay near, you know, the stay near home and they go out a little bit too, programming is backed up or back up and going. We're going to have to start navigating different conversations with our families and with the, the youth that we serve. And as parents, we have to navigate those kinds of conversations as well. So I just wanted to take a minute and get a sense from you. You guys can put in the text chat. Where are you in terms of re-entry after COVID? How, how many of you have started going back into programs and um, in your personal life? How many of you have started moving back into more public spheres? Is this something that's, that's happening uh, already or something you're contemplating? And, and, and while you're typing your answers, I'll let you know that we've done very little uh, we haven't, our, our, I have a 16 and a 19 year old. My 16 year old has had um, some interactions with her peers, but not in a public setting. It's more like they go for a walk in the neighborhood and that's happening for the past couple of months or past, past couple of weeks. So we've had to nego negotiate those conversations in our house. Um, okay, so some of you have been going into the office, a, a selected amount. Um, being with friends, but in private settings, online only, not yet. So it sounds like many of you are in the same position that I'm in where um, we're going to have to start navigating those conversations. So um, if your kids are like, like my 16 year old, can't wait to get out in public and, and do great work. My dog says hi, by the way. <laughs> um, so when we're getting ready to navigate those, those decisions, what we have to think about is boundaries. Yes, yeah, so, so close family, grocery stores, a um, few people. So we're all, it seems like m most of us are still keeping our circles pretty tight. Um, so, so we've got to figure that out. So I think we're all fairly in, the, in a similar boat. And I don't know about you, but for me, boundaries are hard all the time. So, you know, tell, making a decision about what I can and can't do or what my children can and can't do in the best of times is sometimes a difficult conversation. Um, but it's especially difficult when our decisions could impact the well being of young people and our family members, the people that we love the most. So, just recognizing that creating those boundaries is gonna be something you wanna be thoughtful and intentional about. And I'm, I'm, I know you all know this, but it's really that idea that communication is key. So as we're navigating those conversations, particularly with young people, I think it's really important that as adults, we set expectations, we let them know. In our house, this is a rule. My kids know if they're gonna be out in a public space, they have to wear a mask. Now, it's a little easier in North Carolina right now because the governor just said everybody has to wear a mask. So I can say we're going to follow that recommendation by the government. Um, that, that, fits, that fits well. So that's the expectation. That's the rule in our house. Uh, we're going to have another rule that's one or two people only. We're not going to gather in big gatherings. But that's for me. You have to set those expectations with the young people and the family members in in your life. However, if we're just mandating all these rules, then sometimes our young people might feel a sense of, of frustration and re rebellion. And, and so um, helping them be a part of that conversation, I would say, is the other key piece. So we're setting some boundaries, but we're also open to input um, from our young people to see what, what they have to say about the decisions that are impacting their life. And showing empathy can be an outstanding opportunity to build that connection with your young person. It is really disappointing that you can't go on the, the trip with all your friends. 
I can see why you'd be really upset about that. Yeah, I'm sorry COVID is happening and this is, this stinks. So showing empathy, validating those feelings, um, and helping your young people make appropriate decisions as part of the decision making process. So boiling it all down to setting those boundaries is difficult. It's different for every family. Crystal was just telling us that she had to make a really hard decision about a family vacation. We have to make really hard decisions about peer interactions. I know we're all having different, different kinds of conversations. So those are just uh, some tips for navigating those boundaries and just making sure that we're setting our expectations and our, our expectations are clear, um, that we're showing empathy and, and reflecting feelings if our young people or family members are not super engaged with our with our decisions and also giving them a chance to make some the young people some decisions to make their own boundaries and decisions so um okay now i can't wait to get back to elizabeth and some of the answer to some of the questions but now is our q a we have about about five or seven minutes for some q a so um i'm gonna i'm gonna stop my talking and turn it back over okay Thank you, thank you, thank you so much um, to to all of you. And um, like I heard Catherine say it early on, and Kim, what you just said is, you know, even as things are opened and reopened, we still have a decision to make about you know what our comfort levels are. Uh, and I, I think it was Catherine that said, ask people just because something is open and they're having you you know, as a, as a person making a decision for yourself, for your family, or for your children, you can still ask questions about what's in place, you know, so that you can then make a better decision as to just because it's open doesn't mean you, you might feel comfortable to go or, or participate. So those are, those are important. It doesn't make it easy, but um, you definitely have the, the right and even the responsibility to check it, right? And be sure. So Elizabeth, have you been watching the chat? <laughs> Yep, I went and wrote down um, a lot of the questions that I saw and just some quick answers to them. So I'm going to go through the ones that I have. And if I missed one, I'm sorry, I was trying to keep up with it. Oh, um, we'll catch up. <laughs> yeah. I did have a question about how to disinfect an N95. Um, the answer is it's possible but difficult. So N95s right now are requesting to be left for medical personnel um, that are working in the hospitals and in the ERs. Um, if you do have one, cleaning it usually requires a lot of stuff that the hospitals usually only do. The, you see the UV lights and the ion dispensers and all those kinds of things um, because the N95 is so thick. It doesn't, you can't just throw it in the washer. You can't just spray it, that kind of thing. I would always suggest getting another mask after you've gone through the N95's useful life. Um, and that's just personally what I would suggest. Um, someone asked if you can air dry in your home. Yes, you can air dry your mask in your home. Just make sure it is completely, completely dry before wearing it. You don't want it to be wet and kind of just a host for bacteria, essentially. Um, yes, you can disinfect with the UV light if you have one. That's a good, good thing. We do it a lot with the ambulances and stuff. There's actually UV lights we can hang from the inside of the ambulance and disinfects. Um, Someone asked about glasses fogging. So I put my glasses back on so you all can see. Um, personally, I have not found a complete answer to that. Um, I do know that certain kinds of masks have made it easier for me to prevent my glasses from fogging versus others. Um, for example, I had someone make me a mask that has a bobby pin actually put in up here. Um, so that way it molds to my nose. Um, and if something is closer molded to my nose, my glasses tend not to fog up as much. Um, but it's kind of hard to, to fully. And I've seen all the different hacks about um, toothpaste or about, you know, shaving cream on your lenses. I don't, I wouldn't suggest any of that because I don't want to mess up your glasses. So if you have contacts, wear them. That's what I've been trying to do. But I like my glasses better. So. Here we are. Um, someone asked about how long to wear disposable masks. I did mention it. 
um, CDC recommends eight to 12 hours max of total wear time. So that doesn't mean after 12 hours in one day and you've only worn your mask for 30 minutes, you wanna throw it out. So just kind of track how long you're, you're wearing it and keeping it on when you're going in the store or when you're interacting with others, say at a restaurant. Um, someone asked about cloth masks, whether to wash before wearing. Um, I would say, yes, you get it, wash it before wearing it, um, especially if you order it from online and you're not sure where it came from. Um, one thing I didn't mention, if you have like a mesh garment bag that you use um, to wash more delicate clothing, I would suggest investing in one of those or getting one of those. Then you just put your mask in the bag, put it in with the rest of um, your clothing in your regular washer, and then you don't have to worry about the elastic and everything getting caught up on the rest of your clothes. Um, Herman asked about wearing a mask with a beard. It's not ideal. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, I'm not shaving my beard, you know, that kind of thing. Um, some protection is better than none. And if you have a very close beard um, or one that's not, you know, super long, you're still, it's still going to be effective and it's still going to help you out. Um, just make sure you're getting a well-fitting mask for your face shape. Someone just asked, can we spray alcohol to the masks? Uh, it's one of those things where it's, I honestly would prefer you just throw it in the washer with your laundry detergent um, and hot water. Um, and then you're not worried about in inhaling any of the alcohol solution, the bleach solution, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if you do want to Lysol it, you can, but make sure it air dries out in the open for several, several hours, just so you're not inhaling all of that directly into your lungs. Elizabeth, there was a question posted I'd like to um, hear you address, and it has to do with the face shields that, that we're now starting to see people wearing. Any thoughts or perspectives on those? Um, for everyday use, I think there's gonna have to be more research done on them. Um, we sometimes use them in the ER setting or in the back of a truck, just depending on what's going on. Um, I don't know if they're going to be necessary for every day going to the grocery store. Um, but that's my personal opinion. I really want to see more of what the CDC puts out. Um, and if there's any been research done before we make decisions on whether you need a mask and a face shield and gloves and all that kind of stuff. Um, someone also asked um, about your oxygen supply while wearing a mask. And I know that's been a very hot topic in the news lately. Um, and you see on people on Facebook saying, well, if I wear a mask and then it's going to cut down my oxygen supply and I'll be breathing in carbon dioxide, that's not going to be a big concern with your cloth and disposable masks because they're so porous, they allow everything to come in and out as far as those air particles. So these aren't gonna be the issue. You do see sometimes more of an issue with an N95 because they are much more closed off and much less porous than cloth or a regular filter is. Um, but most people won't be wearing it to the extent that you're in a mask for 18 to 24 hours um, and currently I mean articles from the CDC um, BBC has reported on it um, doctors have done testing and you can even see on Facebook people wearing their mask and they put the little monitor on their finger and their blood oxygen saturations are normal so coming into play long term we'll have to see but for right now I think everyone's safe you're safe to wear a mask Thank you, Elizabeth. We are coming to the close of our time. I do see a, a couple of other questions in the poll. So I'm going to ask you one more while I pull up the last screen. And someone mentioned they see a lot of people wearing masks while they're driving. And do they need to be wearing masks when they're driving? No, um, you do not have to be wearing a mask while you are driving in your own personal vehicle, unless, say, you drive for Uber 
or Lyft and you have other people with you that you aren't you know, familiar with, um, but driving in your own vehicle to work in the morning, you don't need to be wearing a mask. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists for being here to help us uh, sort back through the where we are with some of the details and and how uh, I posted in the chat, Elizabeth, I was one of the people that said, oh my gosh, I've been doing this wrong. So um, yes, thank you. I'll be re-looking at the video and practicing at home a little better. Um, and thank you all just for helping us navigate this conversation. For everyone who's here, um, stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks all.